Thank you, David. Um, first, I'd like to thank the organising committee for inviting me to speak to you here today. Uh, can you hear me at the back? Yes? Yep? Okay. Um, and to thank you for coming in here this morning early. Um, this will be the first talk of a very long conference for you, so thank you for attending my particular session. Um, the title of my presentation is Intensive Care of the Newborn Dairy Calf, but the subtitle is what I'm going to focus on. So the subtitle here is Taking Knowledge and Putting it into Practice. So my presentation is focused on veterinary practitioners. Uh, it'll be a pracademic lecture. By that I mean I will emphasize the practical, but I will underpin it with the academic. So that's the focus of my presentation this morning. What are my objectives? What I, what I hope will happen differently when you leave this hall than before you come into this hall? I'm hoping that you will start a conversation with your client about three topics I've chosen, which are perinatal losses, assessment of perinatal vitality, and care of the newborn calf. I've just chosen three topics because I think any lecture that tends to present too many topics achieves nothing. So we'll focus on a very narrow area. I'm dividing calvings here simplistically into two types. The first is the calving that occurs reasonably normally, and there's a good outcome from that calving. The second type is the calving where there's a problem. And we know that in approximately 40% of dairy heifer calvings, there's assistance, and in some studies, up to 50%. And in a proportion of these, a small proportion of these, there may be adverse outcomes for the fetus. So at some of these calvings, the veterinarian will attend and they will have a conversation with the client about what went wrong perhaps at the calving. But in the majority of cases, the veterinarian will not attend the calving. So in some studies, over 99% of calvings, there is no veterinarian present. So no matter how good the skills of the veterinarian are at calving cows and doing caesarean sections, at a herd health perspective, that conversation is less important than implementing best practice on the farm when the veterinarian is not present. So that is the focus of my presentation today, the calvings that occur on the farm when the veterinarian is not present. So do we need to take knowledge and implement it in practice? All of us that visit farms regularly know that best practice does not occur on all farms. And this is an international phenomenon. And in this specific area, we know that the first responders vary widely in their knowledge and skills. So this is an example of a calving, and I can see no best practice occurring here. But I'm referring to human medical literature here, and I will do that throughout the presentation. It has been shown that standardized formal training in neonatal resuscitation significantly reduces neonatal mortality in babies. So if it can be done in babies, I posit the question, do we need more formal calf care training in the agricultural industry? You could raise the point that, well, perinatal mortality is not a major problem, certainly not compared to fertility or mastitis or lameness, but could we do better? So in order to see where we are internationally, I've taken all the relevant species and I've included babies as a gold standard. I've taken the latest and or the largest data sets available and published to give us a bird's eye view of where we are in neonatal mortality. As you can see on the screen, and the definition of perinatal here is zero to two days, but for babies it goes zero to seven days. Even with that caveat, the loss rate in babies is less than 1%, 0.7% and it varies up to 20% in pigs. And obviously for the polytocus species, we would expect higher loss rates. So for the, the lambs, the pigs, um, and the pups, we'd expect higher rates. But our target for the um, calves, and essentially most of this literature is Boss Towers literature, we should be targeting the figure for folds. So we should be looking at figures that are lower than where they are currently. So if we're at 5%, we should be dropping down to at least 3% as an international norm. So we can do better. <clears throat> because some of us learn pictorially rather than through numbers, in this slide I've used images and the size and the position of the images on the screen indicates the relative importance of the causes of perinatal mortality in cattle. So the first major cause are problems that occur at calving such as bradytosia. These are prolonged calvings. Secondly, maldispositions that occur at calvings, malpresentations or malpostures. <clears throat> Thirdly, and perhaps surprisingly, 
lethal or et economically lethal congenital defects are a major undiagnosed cause of calf mortality. Then we have hemorrhages and anemia that occur around calving, premature placental separation. Surprisingly, perhaps traumatosia in modern dairy herds is much less important than it was heretofore. Calving management practices and the animals we calved have changed quite a bit with time. And only in a small percentage of cases, a recent uh, nice Polish study showed that only 10% of term calves die because of infection, which is quite a contrast with aborted calves. And of course, we have a proportion of calves where there's no diagnosis reached. So this is a pictorial presentation of why calves die around birth and their standard procedures to make these diagnoses. And the points I'd make about them are the majority of deaths are calving related. They're not infectious. It tends to be a problem herd problem. So there isn't a normal distribution of loss. There's a skewed distribution. And in the majority of cases, there's no necropsy conducted. So neither the farmer nor the veterinarian actually knows why the calf died. <clears throat> so for the calf that we're interested in here this morning, these problems will occur at the high risk calving. And it's not difficult to enumerate which these are. This is the prolonged calving, which may be stage one or two or both. The difficult assistance, which may be the excess assistance that occurs or the duration of the assistance that occurs. Maldispositions, as mentioned previously. Twins, particularly the unexpected twin, typically the second twin. C-sections that are conducted in an emergency rather than an elective procedure and the non-clinical dystocia, the calving that starts out normally, but problems occur during the calving, sometimes induced by the assistance at the calving. So these are the high-risk calvings. <clears throat> and this is a nice slide um, showing the, essentially the curvilinear relationship between calving difficulty and vigor of the calf. And, and counterintuitively in this data set, high vigor score is poor vigor. But essentially the more difficult the calving becomes, the less vigorous the product from that calving. This is a, a terribly simplistic slide, even though it looks quite complex, of the simple pathophysiology of why calves are weak at calving. And this essentially is describing the dystochic utero-placental circulations that's disturbed, resulti resulting in fetal hypoperfusion and ultimately asphyxia that may be physiological, because it's normal to have asphyxia during calving, or pathological, resulting in loss. So during difficult calvings, there's prolonged uterine contractions, there may be placental separation, which may be premature. There may be placentitis involved. There may be occlusion of the umbilical cord. There may be accidents with the cord, wrapped around parts of the fetus, a torsion of the cord, breakages of the cord, compression of the cord, numerous problems that occur, particularly in long cord calves. All of these features result in reduced umbilical blood flow to the fetus. And the outcome of that is a respiratory acidosis. So there's hypoxia in the fetus, hypercapnia in the fetus. And the result of these is that the anaerobic glycolysis of glucose through pyruvate does not result in carbon dioxide and water, it results in lactic acid. So you get a hyperlactatemia resulting in metabolic acidosis. So in these calves that are compromised at birth, you get a mixture of respiratory and a metabolic acidosis. And physiologically, the respiratory acidosis abates within hours, whereas the metabolic acidosis can take days to abate. And this, if this is severe or prolonged, that asphyxia will kill the calf. So a very quick, simple run through the basic biochemistry of why weak calves are weak. <clears throat> so I've spoke about perinatal mortality, but I haven't been that specific about the timing of it. So I've selected this data set mainly because it's extremely large, 3.4 million calves, and it's relatively recent. And in this data set, what you can clearly see is that the losses that occur within two days of birth are greater than at any other period of the calf's life up to first calving. And this data set could be repeated internationally. I just took an example of a data set. It happens to be from France. I then looked within an Irish data set at calves that die in that two-day period. And what you can see on the slide is that two-thirds of the loss occurs within an hour of birth, and 75% of the loss occurs in calves that were alive at the start of calving. The remainder of the calves are dead before the calving begins. So that tells us that three quarters of the calves that die within two days of birth were alive when calving began. So whatever we do or don't do potentially impacts that loss. More specifically, if we look at those same time periods and examine 
The degree of atelectasis, the degree of inflation or deflation in the lungs of these calves, we can see as expected that calves that die prepartum, their lungs are completely deflated, for example here, and calves that die 1 to 48 hours postpartum have totally inflated lungs. But the interesting group are here. So in this group that die within an hour of birth but were alive at the start of calving, over half of those calves have partially or completely inflated lungs. So these are the calves, along with the calves that are survived to an hour, that we target with resuscitation at calving. I'm going to use this medical construct of the golden hour purely as an example of how we can use a nudge factor to perhaps change practice at farm level. This is essentially the concept whereby if within an hour of a human suffering severe trauma, particularly cerebral trauma, that they're brought to a hospital and treated, the outcome from the patient is much better than if the same treatment is given hours later. Time matters, and the same principle applies in the calf. So it's rapid assessment and rapid intervention. So essentially the two topics I'm going to focus on today are assessment of the calf immediately and then to initiate resuscitation <coughs> as required. Also within this golden hour, standard practice would be to apply umbilical antiseptics or not, to feed colostrum, to tag the calf and to remove the calf from the calving environment to re reduce the risk of MAP infection. So there's much more a farmer needs to do within that hour, but I'm focusing on a very narrow area for this presentation. Even though I'm going to emphasize that hour, I'm now going to bring that hour forward to see the impact that has on the calf in the first two weeks of life. So these are some nice data from a Hungarian study that basically x-rayed the lungs of calves that were born by caesarean section from birth through to 24 hours of age. And you can see in the lung of the calf, this is 30 minutes after it's born, it's quite opaque. And this opacification of the lung is due to the retention and accumulation of fluid within the lung still. But by 24 hours of age, the calf had clear lungs, and the study didn't conduct uh, any examination thereafter. But perhaps a more interesting study is a German study that examined by CT scanning the calves of lungs from one hour to three weeks of age. And in this scan, the dark areas represent inflated lung. So an hour after birth, only between 50 and 80% of the lung area is actually respiring. And you can see it tends to be the dorsal area, approximately 80%, and less than 50% in the ventral area. And it takes for vaginally born calves two weeks for 100% of the lung area to be respiring normally. So it all doesn't happen at calving, but what we do at calving impacts what happens thereafter. And it's visually seen on the screen. Okay, so to move to assessment of perinatal vitality. This essentially in medical terms would be clinical triage. So on a large seasonally calving herd, it would not be unusual to have 5, 10, 15, or perhaps 20 calves born within a 24-hour period. So a farmer may be presented with five simultaneous calvings, and they have to make decisions about which calving do I need to assist, which calf do I need to assist, and which do I not need to assist. So it's triage. And essentially, they're looking for the at-risk calf. This is the calf that is at greater risk of morbidity or mortality. <clears throat> And the farmer essentially can start before the calving begins. So in this case, they're trying to assess the fetus inside in the cow and determine before the calving begins, is there likely to be a problem? And in this case, they're using simply physical examination and clinical judgment. So if they look at this amnion here, the question they're asking themselves, is it normal or not? When they look at this fetus here, what can I know about that fetus before it's born that might predict it will have a problem when it's born? <clears throat> so this is essentially assessing the conceptus, the fetus and the membranes. And this is simply a physical examination. So for example, this is the amnion, I've called it the water bag. So these would be the features, the translucent would be normal, brown would indicate meconium release, uh, red would indicate there's been hemorrhage, cotyledons would indicate that the placenta has already begun to separate, and if it's fetid, it would indicate that the fetus or one of the fetuses is already dead. The fetal reflexes, the peel reflex is particularly responsive to acidosis, so it's the most sensitive indicator of fetal status, but also the ocular reflex, and obviously in calves presented in posterior presentation, the anal reflex. And in the head, and I'll show images of this, a red muzzle, swollen muzzle, swollen tongue, firm dark tongue, cyanotic gums, all indication of potential fetal compromise. 
And with the legs, legs that are immobile, they're swollen, they're stained, they're cold, they're dry, or they're crossed, these are all indications that this fetus, even before it's born, may be compromised. All I've shown there are simple things that a farmer and a veterinarian can and often do, but technology has moved on, so we can use cardiotechography to measure fetal heart rate, we can use pulse oximetry to measure uh, oxygen saturation of the blood, we can use Doppler sonography to measure umbilical blood flow, blood gases, but unfortunately, currently, none of these really have clinical utility. They're fine for research studies and they explain the basic fundamentals of cabin physiology, but they're not something currently that can be used by a veterinary practitioner. <clears throat> so, if you've listened to what I've just said over the last few minutes, you should be able to look at that slide and see at least five indicators of potential fetal compromise in that calf before it's born. And I will show you this calf again during the presentation. As soon as the calf is born, again, we can use clinical indicators. So both of these calves are lying wet on the ground after calving. And I calved this one, so that calf is alive. But these two calves are physiologically very different, even though they look like two wet calves on the ground. So this comes to the area of biophysical profiling. So back in 1953, Virginia Apgar produced a profiling system for babies that's been modified ever since in both babies and in calves to profile the status of the calf at birth. And obviously this again has moved on, computerized tomography is used, pulse oximetry, blood gases for babies. As I mentioned in calves, we don't use those. But we have moved on in biophysical profiling of calves. This is perhaps the zenith of profiling. This is a very detailed scoring system called VIGOR, V-I-G-O-R. We'll excuse the spelling mistake. This is a North American, specifically a Canadian scoring system, which gives very detailed information about the calf after birth. And you'll discover if you use this that it's quite normal for a calf to have tachycardia, tachyopnea, mild pyrexia immediately after it's born. So physiologically, the calf then is different from the calf of two days later. And while this is an, a, an essential and uh, excellent tool for research, you could debate it is perhaps complex for use in practice. And it has been suggested that simpler tools such as tongue withdrawal or suck reflex might be just as effective in assessing the calf as using this very detailed tool. This is one of the standard metrics that's used to assess a calf after birth. So this calf is lying in the straw with its head down. In this case, the calf is attempting to head right, that's raise its own head spontaneously. In this case, the calf is attempting to get into sternal recumbents. In this case, the calf is in sternal recumbents. So the vital calf within five minutes of an unassisted calving should look like this, and within nine minutes of calving in a dystochic calving. So these are physiological indicators of how the calf should look after birth. Of course, in intensive management systems, we don't give the calf time to do this. People grab the calf immediately after it's born, put it into recumbents, and start feeding the calf. But physiologically, this is what should happen. And in human medicine, they describe the power hour, which is when things should happen on target. These are the vitality markers we should hit. And we can use these for the calf also. So the first breath should be within 30 seconds of being born. They should head right within three minutes. They should attain sternal recumbents within five minutes. They should be attempting to stand within 15 minutes and they should be standing and or sucking within an hour. So calves that are not achieving these targets are potentially compromised and potentially require extra care. So these are calves that we need to look for the indications for resuscitation. So if we look in calves, the most important is some abnormality in respiration. So that may be failure to spontaneously breathe, gasping, irregular, infrequent breaths, or bellowing or bawling. <clears throat> Persistent or absent reflexes, or poor or absent reflexes, particularly the pedal, but also the others. And I've mentioned the suck reflex already. Poor muscle tone, lateral recumbents too long, flaccid muscles not attempting to head right. Interesting, when I looked at the human medical literature for babies, unlike in the veterinary literature, there is consensus on this already. So in 2015, a consensus document showed what are the key indicators you should use to immediately assess a baby after birth. <clears throat> They're not dissimilar from those in calves, which is the baby is preterm, it's meconium stained, it's flaccid or flat, or there's no cry. <clears throat> These are the immediate indicators for resuscitation of the baby. So what should we do with the weak calf? We've assessed that there is a weak calf, should, what should we do with it? It's not the veterinarian, it's the farmer is the first responder, 
and they provide the BLS, that's basic life support. So for the farmer's perspective, if they're not there, then they don't care. So that points to calving supervision. So you can't resuscitate a calf at a calving at which you don't attend. They only need to address the at-risk calf and define which are those. Uh, they can act during rather than at the end of calving. And there are DNR cases. There are cases where it is pointless attempting to resuscitate the calf. And I've just picked two examples here, fatal fetal abnormalities. So in Europe, over this last few years, we've had <clears throat> the Schmallenberg virus outbreak. So we know that there are lots of these cases can potentially occur on farms. And then there's fatal and severe or polytrauma tosia, sometimes linked to the former. And these are cases where resuscitation will not reverse the problem. If you fracture the spine of the calf due to a trauma tosia, then using resuscitation procedures will not make that calf live. In the remainder of the talk, I'm going to discuss the various procedures we can use to resuscitate the calf, but I'm putting a caveat in at the beginning of this, which is that there's a very limited corpus of veterinary literature specifically on resuscitation. So when I look for the literature, this is the logarithmic increase in literature about resuscitation, but unfortunately, that's driven by the medical literature. And if we look at the veterinary literature here, it practically flatlines. So there are very few data on veterinary resuscitation available to us to discuss this morning. However, because the medics have been at this for so long, in 1990, they started producing their guidelines for CPR in humans. It took until 2012 for a group of committed veterinarians to raise this campaign, which was to produce guidelines for resuscitation of animals. Unfortunately, the animals they chose were small animals, so there now are very detailed guidelines for CPR in small animals, and they essentially decided that there were more similarities between babies and small animals than differences, so they could rely on the medical literature to inform the small animal literature, which is kind of ironic because the medical literature is essentially informed by large animal literature. The classical model for fetal respiratory physiology is the lamb. It's not the dog or the pup. So in actual fact, the large animal medicine has given to this literature, but hasn't taken back from it. Okay, so moving on to resuscitation of the weak, of the weak calf. This is now called CPCR in the modern literature. And the essential core point to remember here is that respiratory arrest precedes cardiac arrest. So the focus is on the respiratory, not the cardiac component. <clears throat> on all farms, there would be some kind of a kit that is used at each calving, or perhaps only at the difficult calvings, and then for the calf immediately after calving. But if we're going to implement some of the procedures I'm discussing here today, that kit needs to be enlarged. So this would be standard kit on any farm. There would be some gloves. There may or may not be a calving jack. Some farmers don't like using them. Some vets don't like using them. But often there is, and there'll be a bucket to wash it down. So that would be standard calving kit. But if the farmer is going to introduce some of the practices I'm discussing this morning, they need more equipment. Not necessarily all of this, but some of it. So we've mentioned the use of needles and syringes, resuscitators, suction pumps, PPV vags or masks, stimulant drugs, oxygen. All of these I'll discuss this morning. So if you're going to do this, you need the relevant equipment. As well as the other routine kit, which would be a navel antiseptic, stomach tube, tags and tagger, and a calf barrel. So that's all the equipment that would be in any standard modern uh, calf rearing unit. So I'm going to go through reasonably quickly, given the time available, decision three algorithm <clears throat> for assessing the calf and then dividing the calves into two simple groups. The first is the calf is normal, and the second is the calf is weak, using the criteria I've already shown previously. And I won't drip down through all of these, but essentially the calf is born. First thing the farmer does is check the sex of the calf. It's just a human reaction. Next, umbilical antisepsis, place in sternal recumbents, feed colostrum, tag calf, remove calf. It's a very simple SOP procedure that I don't think varies hugely internationally, but we may have questions on that. Whereas dealing with, <coughs> dealing with a weak calf is quite different. This calf needs individual attention, and it needs more attention, and it needs attention given immediately after birth. And if we look at some of the procedures that are highlighted here, when I looked at the literature for babies, they're very similar to this, apart from less reliance on pharmacological intervention. Similar procedures are used in babies. So I mentioned that you can resuscitate during calving. So in this calving here, I've set it up to look like a hip lock. This is where the hips of the, the fetus are engaged in the pelvis of the cow and they can't be released. So at that point, the thorax of the calf is outside of the cow. So this calf, you can attempt resuscitation 
but being conscious of the fact that because the calf is in lateral recumbence, any procedure you implement will only affect the upper lung and not the lower lung. And I'll show that graphically shortly. This is the calf that I showed earlier that had all those signs of fetal compromise. And I think even on the photograph, if you look at the eye of that calf, you can see clearly this calf is alive, but again, perhaps stuck at the hips. And you can see that the attendant there is attempting to stimulate that calf via nasal stimulation. So before the calf is fully born, you can start to do something about the outcome of the calving. So the ABC of resuscitation simply begins with establishing a patent airway. <coughs> the basic physiological point to remember here is that the majority of fluid in the lungs is resorbed back into the lymphatic system. And most of the remainder is expelled with the compression of the fetus in the pelvic cavity during vaginal passage, which of course doesn't occur in C-section drive calves. <clears throat> so before we look at removing fluid, the first thing is the patency of the airway. So this here is what's colloquially called born in the bag or born enclosed in the amnion or technically anamniorexis. So this is where the calf is born enclosed in the amnion. It occurs in less than 1% of stillborn calves and the predominance of these cases occur in heifers' calves and there are numerous potential causes of it, but essentially for a farmer, <clears throat> Their first duty is to remove that membrane because in about three quarters of these cases, the calf dies during or after birth, not before birth. So potentially this feature could impact the viability of the calf. Manually clear fluid from the nostrils and mouth. And perhaps more interestingly, aspiration. Um, this is something that's used in human medicine and it can be used in calves and there are various uh, devices available. Um, <clears throat> and I'll show you just briefly some data supporting the use of these. So firstly, they can improve pulmonary function and they moderate the decline in temperature. I mentioned previously that calves are born with quite a high rectal temperature and it can drop quite dramatically after birth and these devices have been shown to moderate that decline. <clears throat> so this is an example of just one metric which is PACO2. So the suction calves are shown here in black and generally it's better to have a lower carbon dioxide concentration in the blood. And I think you can see after the baseline data that it is lower certainly in the first hour, and generally thereafter in calves that have been suctioned at birth. And that's simply using this vitalograph device, which is very simple to use. So a clinical benefit to using a device to resuscitate calves at birth. <coughs> another, <coughs> another way of clearing the airways is to briefly, that's less than about a minute and a half, atraumatically, atraumatically for the calf and atraumatically for the farmer to suspend the calf. This removes a very small volume of lung fluid, less than 50 mil, but it does improve gas exchange. So this is the fluid coming from the calf, and yes, the majority of the fluid that comes from the calf does come from the abomasum, and no, there's no real evidence that that dehydrates the calf. So this is nature's model of this already. We've all seen this at a calving. A cow stands up during stage two, the calf hasn't disengaged its hips, and it hangs from the back of the cow, and it naturally drains fluid. We can do this by simply taking the calving ropes off the front legs of the calf, putting them on the back legs of the calf, and running the calf up along the calving jack. And there are hoists and various devices available to do this. This is currently indicated with uh, pups and lambs, contraindicated in babies because of health and safety issues with, with raising babies, and contraindicated in foals, I presume from logistical reasons also. And I'll come back to that uh, later. So after clearing an airway, the next thing is to establish and to maintain respiration. So this simple term is physical resuscitation. This does induce a gasp reflex. So whether that's simply with a straw, or this is the calf we looked at earlier with nasal stimulation, or acupuncture, <clears throat> and I have no particular expertise in acupuncture, but there are good studies showing that acupuncture does stimulate breathing. And the point for stimulation here is in the filtrum of the calf. And I think perhaps where we fail when we use this technique as non-experts is that we don't use the technique correctly and we don't spend long enough doing it. So people have used this and said it doesn't work, but perhaps we're not practiced in the technique. Other examples of physical resuscitation <clears throat> is hypothermal stimulation. This is now uh, taken as therapeutic hypothermia for babies. So if babies are compromised at birth, it's standard practice to cool the baby or specifically the head as soon as possible after birth. And this is a neuroprotectant effect on HIE, which is hypoxia and ischemia encephalopathy at birth. So this prevents any sequelae from that. So cooling is a standard practice. 
In calves, it induces a gasp reflex and it improves gas exchange. So this is simply using cold water, large volume of it, liters of cold water, pouring it into the ear or on the herd. And I had, have heard of cases where calves have been immersed in cold water, similar to lambs. They're often immersed in water troughs. Um, the same effect. We can also use compression and expansion of the thorax, raising and lowering the costal arch to induce negative interthoracic pressure. So simple physical ways of physically resuscitating a calf. But perhaps the most important thing a farmer can do at a calving is to place the calf in the recovery position. And the recovery position for a calf after birth is sternal recumbence. But as we've seen earlier, a calf that's compromised at birth will take quite some time to attain this position. So what does this do? It prevents hypostatic congestion, it increases lung expansion, and it improves gas exchange. So by simply posturally correcting the calf, we do quite a lot for the physiology of the calf. So this is an example of a calf that died lying on its right-hand side where the farmer didn't know what to do with the calf. And we can clearly see here that the dependent lung is hypostatically congested and atelectatic, whereas the non-dependent lung is aerated and functioning. So this can simply be done. In this case, I've just calved the heifer. The heifer's not in any rush to get up. I simply take the calf and put it on the heifer. Very simple. In this case, I've placed the calf in the dog sitting position, and the interesting part of this photograph is not what I'm doing, it's what I'm wearing. So simply by dirt of the fact that I'm wearing wet gear and I'm prepared to kneel down in wet bedding and support the calf, because once you put the calf into this position, they will automatically fall on their side. But by having the correct gear and being prepared to spend time with the calf, the calf will stay in that position. It's simple practice. So this is essentially how the calf should look within five minutes of birth, whether it does so naturally or you intervene. So now let's look at some of the data that underpins these procedures. So these are studies that compared lateral sternal uh, recumbence or suspension. So the first study here is a study conducted on sea certain derived Belgian blue calves. These are not dairy, vaginally born calves. And the data from this study showed consistent benefits from sternal recumbence or suspension in blood glasses and hematology, and specifically in time to sternal recumbence for suspension. So calves are suspended versus those left in lateral recumbence. Those suspended attain sternal recumbence quicker. There was also some additional benefits in suspension over sternal recumbence. They attained a higher pH quicker, they had better hematological metrics, and they also had better lung compliance. And interestingly, in suspending the calf, the longer within a window of approximately 90 seconds that the calf is suspended, the greater the benefits. I've taken an example of just one variable from this study, PaO2. This is shown here, the sternal and the suspended calves are in the light bars. And you can see, in general, these calves achieve better metrics than the calves that are not, um, not suspended. This, by comparison, is a different study. It's conducted in vaginally born Holstein Frisian calves. And because the calf that's born at cesarean section doesn't have the opportunity to go through the birth passage and release the lung fluid, these calves have already had that opportunity. So the potential benefits to the procedure are likely to be less. And the study confirmed this. The benefits were minor and they were inconsistent from sternal recumbence or suspension over lateral recumbence. And the benefits were mainly shown within the first five minutes of birth. So the sternal and the suspended calves are shown here. And you can see at five minutes, that again for PaO2, they have better uh, metrics for that variable. We can also use positive pressure ventilation, and again, this is something that's used with babies. What does this do? It improves gas exchange, inflates atelectatic lungs, and reduces the time, tends to reduce the time to sternal recumbents. And these are a small data set looking at blood oxygen uh, and blood CO2 using one of these devices, the McCulloch device, showing benefits to using the device. This was in uh, Korea. And this is a study in calves, dystochic and caesarean-born calves, showing the benefits of using either of these two devices shown here compared to calves that were hung or uh, immersed with cold water in time to sternal recumbents. So, so benefits to using the uh, devices. And there are various different types of devices can be used. This is the Ambu bag. This is the calf resuscitator. And essentially with the calf resuscitator, five compressions of the pump is sufficient to 100% inflate atelectatic lungs. One thing that farmers perhaps are not clear about is that when you attempt to inflate the lungs, the first thing you do is inflate the abomasum. 
So it is critical for the farmer to know on which side of the neck is the esophagus and to compress the esophagus when they're using the device. And often farmers may not know that. Something that practitioners are perhaps more familiar with is pharmacological stimulants. And one of the most commonly used, although internationally that may vary, is doxapram. And it's available for sublingual use or parenteral use, uh, IV. And essentially this acts at a low dose on the peripheral chemoreceptors in the carotid artery and in the aorta. But at a higher dose, it acts centrally as an analeptic. And it has been shown to reduce uh, respiratory acidosis. This is a study here comparing two um, respiratory stimulants. And the upper line uh, for respiratory rate is doxapram, showing an increase in respiratory rate, which will blow off CO2 in these acidemic calves uh, using doxapram in calves. So there's good evidence in calves of the benefits to using this product. Uh, dexamethasone should theoretically be of benefit, particularly in capital edema and potentially um, cerebral edema also, to get calves sucking quicker that have the swollen tongue after birth. Only anecdotal evidence. And recently there's been quite a lot of interest in using caffeine in these um, compromised calves after birth. In North America they call it the 5-hour energy drink or they use wake-up tablets and there's energy paste available in Europe. And this acts as a respiratory stimulant or a neuroprotectant and perhaps is more suited to use for the uh, compromised hypothermic calf than the calf immediately after birth. And while there are mixed results across species, there have generally been positive results with the use of these products. Oxygen therapy, which is not first-line therapy for human babies, 21% oxygen in room air is first-line therapy, but if that fails, oxygen therapy is the backup therapy. Um, it can be used at farm level using simple industrial cylinders with a face mask, um, tubing, very simple equipment. Uh, is it of benefit? Yes, it improves respiration and has, has been shown to improve calf survival. So these are data showing the PO2 rate, both the venous and the arterial, after use of oxygen in calves. So does it benefit the calf? If used correctly, yes, it does. I mentioned earlier about acidosis and the role that plays in the calf being weak or possibly dying, and if that acidosis is prolonged, there are fatal consequences. So sodium bicarbonate is the drug of choice in treating these calves, and it has been shown that sodium bic will raise blood pH, it will raise basic cess, and it will reduce PCO2. The paradoxical hypercapnia associated with the reduce of the product is more theoretical than actual. And these are some data showing two soda bic products and their effect on pH, and you can see an immediate uh, change in the acidosis profile of the calf. Uh, and for convenience, hyperosmotic solutions can now be used, so they can be used as a bolus immediately after the calf is born, <clears throat> administered as soon as possible, but ensuring that the calf is breathing normally first, because if the calf is not respiring normally, they won't be essentially able to blow off the existing hypercapnia that is in the system. This is something that is perhaps new to some of us, others have been using it for years, which is using pain relief in the calf at birth. Uh, this is NSAIDs, and there are now data showing that NSAIDs can improve perinatal vigor, they can improve suckling reflex, they can increase the time spent standing, they can increase milk intake, and critically, they can improve average daily gain in assisted calves. This is a small but growing corpus of literature on a relatively new area of research, and generally showing positive results. I've picked just an example. This is a relatively small but statistically robust study showing the benefits of using an NSAID in newborn calves to statistically significantly improve their vigor after birth. And this is perhaps an area that farmers don't ask vets about, pain relief in the calf. We perhaps don't think about it. Perhaps we should. Establishing normal circulatory function <clears throat> is the last aspect. There will be calves in asystole or bradycardia. In these cases, we need to implement thoracic compression, and the recover review of the veterinary literature said that we don't do this correctly. We don't push hard enough, we don't push fast enough, and we don't push deep enough. So even though we may have been doing this at farm level, we're not doing it correctly. We can do better. And for calves that uh, don't respond to this, the drug of choice is epinephrine, acting as a vasopressor. And in calves that are not critically compromised at birth, this has been shown in babies and it's also been shown in calves. There are benefits to delaying cord clamping for one to five minutes where there isn't an emergency, apologies that didn't come in, to treat the calves. This improves gas exchange and improves the hematocrit variables in the newborn calf. So I've been talking about what we can potentially do at farm level. So let's now ask the question, well, what do farmers actually do? I've picked two large and relatively recent data sets. The first is in dairy calves, a North American data set. 
And essentially looking at this data set, you can see farmers do things that are simple to do, don't require a cost or equipment. That's my sing single summation of that. Interestingly, when we look at a beef data set from Canada, almost exactly the same result. They do things that are simple to do, don't require cost or equipment. But interestingly, there is now a mention of pain medication in that study. And essentially, the first thing they do is they nasally stimulate the calf. What would be really interesting is to ask the question, what do vets, what do you recommend to your clients? This is what they're already doing. So if we look to the future within our own species, the calf, we could look to the clone calf. They're at a technological level above the commercial calf to foals or to babies. There are advanced assisted uh, ventilation techniques used in the clone calf already. We could look to periconception nutritional restriction in the future. And neuroprotectins are actively being trialed in other species and showing benefits. So these are products that prevent the results of hypoxia res resulting in irreversible brain damage. But I would have to say that preventing the need for resuscitation is more important than the best resuscitation we can give if we look at a herd health and not just a calf level. So are there any practical takeaways from this talk? The first one is that I've encouraged you to engage with your clients and communicate on the topic. I've secondly said inadvertently that you should start perhaps considering calf training courses specifically on perinatal care, perhaps writing farm specific SOPs on the topic, re-evaluating your existing resuscitation practices and consider the use of NSAIDs in the newborn calf. So if there's one thing you remember from this talk, perhaps it'll be one of these. With that, I'll conclude, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much.